Hello, 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 and welcome. I'm particularly delighted to be joined today by Adam Johnson. He is a brilliant, um, I suppose, dissident journalist in lots of ways. He's uh, he's the host of the Citations Needed podcast. Do check that out. Also has a Substack where he talks part, I suppose, about critiquing the Western media. So I think no better person to discuss the topic today. And I suppose the reason I want to talk about this is there's two pillars of what I would describe as Western complicity uh, with the horrific atrocity now being committed by the state of Israel. There's the direct Western support, military, obviously, arms, diplomatic, political support. Um, and there is the other pillar is the Western media. Um, and there's two strands of that, I think, which is, A, just overtly cheerleading for this atrocity, but the other is a failure to call out um, what is actually happening, to, to use the proper terminology to describe actual crimes being committed and um, muddying the waters, that kind of thing. I just want to start just as an example. Um, this week, Benjamin Netanyahu, ethnic cleansing. I just want your thoughts. What, just explain what's happened and the way the media have discussed that or just not discussed that. Well, yeah. So I wrote about this yesterday because, you know, part of part, a lot of media criticism is simply pointing out things people say and comparing it to how it's covered in a very simple way and saying there's a disconnect here. Um, so Israeli leaders and Benjamin Netanyahu, chief among them, obviously the most powerful person in Israel, pretty much my entire lifetime, uh, obviously the prime minister of Israel. Um, he is, he has openly acknowledged that they are, they are planning for, or they have as one of their war aims is the forcible displacement of Palestinians out of Gaza by the hundreds of thousands. Uh, this was, this was, there was a plan on November 30th floated in, in, in right-wing pro Netanyahu media in Israel, in Hebrew, suggesting this was a plan. It was very kind of thinly sourced, but was very much a trial balloon saying that Ron Dermer, who's the head uh, aide of Netanyahu was in cap in the United States on Capitol Hill, basically trying to sell this to Congress and trying to find specifically using their connections with evangelical Christians to try to marshal support uh, on Capitol Hill for a plan to forcibly displace Palestinians from Gaza, either in, po in whole or in part. Um, hundreds of thousands uh, was the plan. There's actually a map produced by one one right one Christian uh, is uh, Israeli. Um, kind of Zionist, Christian Zionist organization or adjacent organization that had little arrows going out of Gaza. So then this was reported only by one Western media outlet, which was Ryan Grimm at The Intercept. Most kind of ignored it. They said, oh, it's just anytime there's genocidal rhetoric that comes out of Israel, which is almost on a daily basis, it's dismissed as kind of, oh, that's just locker room talk. Eh, boys will be boys. They're just kind of venting. They're pandering to their... It's always sort of dismissed as this uh, unserious thing they sort of just say, right? But of course, when, when, when Muammar Gaddafi referred to uh, his enemies as cockroaches. That was it, it, that was per se seen as evidence of genocidal intent. There was no further debate in Western media. That that statement alone was seen as genocidal intent. Meanwhile, is, Israeli leaders, including the prime minister, can say something genocidal every day, and it's sort of seen as oh, it's not really serious. So then, uh, back in on December tenth, uh, uh, the somewhat uh, lactose named Danny Dannon, uh, the the the. Um, the, the UN ambassador for Israel, um, he tweeted out a five point plan for quote unquote post-war Gaza that included a, a, a massive voluntary resettlement. This is how they phrase it, voluntary resettlement. Um, now, of course, Israel is not gonna phrase the ex expulsion of Palestinians from Gaza as anything other than voluntary because there are laws against involuntary resettlement. It's called, that's part, that is a subset of genocide that is ethnic cleansing. Um, but when you make a place, deliberately make a place uninhabitable, and you do as Israel has, you raise uh, farmland, uh, cemeteries, you destroy civilian infrastructure, roads, uh, hospitals, obviously, as we know, which we can talk about, uh, you destroy uh, civic institutions, you bulldoze statues of Yasser Arafat, uh, you, you, you level mosques and schools, uh, you destroy the entire civil functioning of a society as they have in the entirety of North Gaza and very well may soon South Gaza. Uh, there's that that's no longer a voluntary resettlement. They have nowhere to go. They are being shoved in a in a in an internment camp, uh, tent city, however you want to phrase it, um, in southwestern Gaza uh, uh, near the border of Egypt uh, and the Mediterranean Sea. That is according to the that is according to the Wall Street Journal smaller than the size of LAX airport. That's that's over two million people. 
Uh, no running water, no medical facilities, no civil in infrastructure, obviously no homes. They, they are living in barely subsisting, subsisting to the extent to which they are. Uh, they are being subject to uh, an outbreak of disease, uh, fungus. Uh, they are, they of course don't have clean water, which they didn't really have prior to the October 7th. Now, anyone would understand this is not uh, a voluntary resettlement. This is, but when you're under bombing and sieging, as, as former head of Human Rights Watch Ken Roth made clear, when you're living under bombing and siege and in living in tent cities, any resettlement is not voluntary, especially when Israel has not been given any indication that it would even be temporary. Uh, they are trying to obviously push as many as possible to the Sinai in Egypt. Now, people will respond to this by saying, oh, well, Egypt's never going to let that happen. Uh, Jordan's not going to let it happen. The fact that there's logistical barriers to a genocide plan is actually not the most important part of the genocide plan, right? <laughs> this is kind of a way to hand wave away this consideration. And you see this a lot. People say, oh, it's not really serious. Well, the most powerful person in Israel has explicitly said it's his aim. Then we should be talking about whether or not we should continue to arm, fund, and diplomatically support uh, a person who is in charge who has explicit genocidal intent. Whether or not there's logistical barriers seems of secondary import. Um, and then on, so then there was the five-point plan released on December 10th by the by the is Israeli UN ambassador. Uh, then on December, uh, sorry, then on December 21st, um, John Hudson, who's the who's the Washington Post reporter, uh, in the uh, who's a Washington Post reporter who covers Israel, wrote, "Quote." In private encounters, Netanyahu urged Biden, uh, Sunak, and Macron to pressure Egyptian President Sisi to take hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from Gaza into, uh, into the Sinai. They each refused the request, noting Sisi doesn't want to be complicit in the mass, mass displacement of Gazans, unquote. Hmm. So here you have the Washington Post reporting quite explicitly that the policy of Israel is to displace, quote unquote, hundreds of thousands of Gazans, which would more or less pretty much mean all of them, or at least most of them, right? In whole or in part. Uh, okay, that's textbook genocidal intent because there's no indication. I don't think anyone credibly believes this would be temporary. This would be some sort of safe haven situation, which is again how they initially tried to frame it. And then, if and then, uh, and then on December 25th, uh, uh, um, Netanyahu explicitly said that that was to to members of the, of the, of the Likud party in a, in a meeting. So that was explicitly his intent. He said in Hebrew, but that, that's what he said, as, as translated by several people on social media. Uh, this is not something that they have ever denied. The initial November 30th report that was reported that was um, uh, reported in Western media by Ryan Grimm at The Intercept, uh, that was not a report that was ever denied by Israeli leaders. That was never denied by Netanyahu. That was never denied by Dermer, that they had that they had made uh, outreach to members of Congress, specifically Republican members of Congress in, Christ in the Christian evangelical community to get support to re relocate Palestinians obviously, ideally in the Sinai, but if need be, they had a map including countries like Yemen, Iraq, because to them, again, ideologically, all Palestinians are just interchangeable Arabs. They have no distinct national identity. They're all just frustrated Jordanians or frustrated Egyptians. They're not sort of real, real people. Um, and that that was an explicit war aim of what you see, and that works within the logic of what we see in Gaza. Right. This is not a quote unquote hunt for Hamas. I wrote a piece in The Nation of, uh, about this about three weeks ago where I said it's time the media stop framing this as a hunt for Hamas, whatever that means, because we have so much evidence. This is, in fact, a war of mass of forcible population transfers. You, you know, if, if one find if one finds the G word too charged or offensive, we'll, we'll put it in more clinical terms. Right. We'll sort of I'll sort of indulge people's sensibilities and say population transfers or forcible population transfers, uh, which again is just a sort of another way of framing ethnic cleansing, um, quite explicitly and quite expressly. And that does not appear in any media. So Ron Dermer was in Washington on Tuesday, uh, pitching his plan to both Blinken and members of, of, of both parties on Capitol Hill. And there was no mention of, of this it, open admission the prior day from, from, from Netanyahu that their goal was to, to try to displace Palestinians outside of Palestine, to re, quote unquote resettlement, quote unquote voluntary resettlement. Uh, and then CNN even, even had a report uh, responding to allegations from, from, a U, from a UN official claiming that Israel's goal was resettlement, uh, enforceable population transfers, and didn't even mention what Netanyahu had said the previous day uh, much less, again, all this other evidence we have, including the UN ambassador um, and reports from John Hudson at the Washington Post and elsewhere. And so 
all this points of evidence, again, forget all the uh, genocidal things that are said by Israeli leaders all the time. And, and again, this plan was also the, 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 the Israeli intelligence minister also had a similar plan in the, in the Jerusalem Post on, on November 19th. Um, forget all the sort of members of, of the Israeli government who've said this. The actual most powerful person said it. And then people jump in and say, well, you know, it's, it's again, it's just locker room talk. And it's like, what other, again, if, if Putin announced a plan to, to, uh, to voluntarily, quote unquote, resettle Ukrainians outside of Ukraine, I think our media would pretty clearly say this is a plan for ethnic cleansing and this, is, this expresses genocidal intent. But when Netanyahu and his, and his confederates do this repeatedly, out in the open, it's just memory hole. This has not been mentioned, as far as I've seen, and any mainstream media, John Hudson is a reporter for the Washington Post, but that was a, it was a tweet. It has not been meaningfully reported out. It has not been discussed. It's not been centered as a war aim. Our media largely is still operating under this liberal delusion that this is a kind of zero dark 30 hunt for Hamas, where a bunch of guys are going through with tactical gear and, and, and they're finding the baddies and merged with a kind of Rambo 2 scenario where they're rescuing hostages, even though Again, nothing Israel has done has indicated that this is their strategy, that their strategy is, in fact, to raise Gaza and to make it uninhabitable, as they explicitly said they were going to do in the eyes, again, as you've documented many times. And so there's there's two parallel, totally, totally different conversations happening, one that exists within Israeli media and among Israeli leaders that is that is at least somewhat related to reality. Again, they'll sort of maybe filter it through some liberal euphemisms about voluntary resettlement, but it's mostly kind of an explicit ex discussion of what the plan is. And then there's this liberal Zionist alternate reality in the American media that's still living in a fantasy that this is some war on terror. Um, and as, as a media critic, it's, it's, it's quite, uh, even by normal standards, it's quite extraordinary to watch. It, it, is, it is a totally different conversation than the one that's, that's happening. And so, so I think that Israeli politicians and to some extent even Republicans in the United States have, have kind of moved on. They, they, they are addressing reality Meanwhile, um, liberal institutions and liberal centrist institutions like the New York Times uh, and the White House are completely in indulging a fantasy for sort of as long as they can before right. it seeks, stops being credible. Because the goal is, of course, to sort of buy time. Because you can't deny the genocidal intent. It's so explicit. So what you really do is you kind of just ignore it and you hope it sort of goes away because of logistical barriers, right? But they'll get in the logistical barriers are not the thing that's important about the genocide plan. Um, kind of reminds me of the Mitchell and Webb sketch where they're like, well, you know, what, what, what if we raise VAT? Like, you know, what, what if we kill all the poor? Will that help the economy? And it's like, well, whether or not it helps the economy is irrelevant. Whether or not it's, there's a logistical barrier is actually not the important question. And I think to the extent to which this has been dismissed in Western media when it has come up, it's been, oh, well, CC's never going to allow it. Oh, uh, well, well, Biden's, now, Biden's made it very clear there will be no forcible population transfers. And it's like, yeah, but should you keep sending weapons and logistics support and aircraft carriers to go help the guy who wants genocide? Because maybe he can find another way. Maybe there's someone who can be, you know, can be bribed or some EU country that these can be resettled to in mass. Um, and it certainly seems like that that messy question is just too awkward to address. So the, the solution is to simply ignore it. And I think, I mean, that's what's so extraordinary, isn't it? It's a combination of intent and action. I mean, I interviewed um, Raz Higal, the uh, Israeli-American yeah. um, hist uh, historian, uh, sorry, specialist in genocide and Holocaust studies, and he said it's rare for intent to be so overtly spoken. Um, so you mentioned examples, but, you know, human animals, as you justify cutting off the basic essentials of life in the total siege, uh, quoting in the case of Netanyahu, Amalek from the Bible, when the Israelites were attacked by the nation of Amalek and God, orders the Israelites to kill all men, women, children, and livestock and babies. I mean, can you imagine an Islamist leader uh, quoted something comparable from right. uh, the Bible, as he, uh, sorry, the Quran, as he was justifying, uh, you know, a similar sort of onslaught? And um, I mean, you know, it's not even just in Gaza. There were two million Nazis in the West Bank. That's virtually the entire Palestinian population in the West Bank. And, um, you know, just what, the whole thing is there's, there's, no, there's no subtlety. And then actually, he gave examples. I mean, another is... Uh, flooding, as they say, Israel, they'll flood the Hamas tunnels with seawater. Um, as the UN Special Rapporteur on Water Rights points out, that would destroy clean, fresh water, clean water in Gaza, leave them unable people to, to live. And he's made point that makes one of the conditions of life impossible. 
Omar Bartov, another Israeli-born American and historian, um, who, who who said that the, the the point with ethnic cleansing is it often becomes genocide because people don't want to leave and therefore you kill them. Right. But, but I think that's what the point you made about just all of that with Russia in Ukraine, that if Putin was do, was doing this, talking in these terms, and then talking about forcible, uh, sorry, about uh, voluntary immigration there wouldn't be a discussion. This would just be dominating the entire coverage. This would be yeah. the story. But it's not even a part of the story in the Western media. And I just find that astonishing. No. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> it's the, it, there's just too much cognitive dissonance when, you're, when your country, the sort of ostensibly liberal wing of a country, is arming and funding and supporting um, this war. And again, there's a sort of specter of Trump. I think that colors a lot of this. Um, but... You know, a lot of delusions about the, the the potential, the sort of squaring the circle of, of liberal support for Israel has never kind of made sense. This is just a more extreme version of it, which is you fundamentally have to deny the reality of what's going on. Uh, you know, Gaza is not occupied. It's just encircled and militarily cut off and they control, the, you know, the what goes in and what goes out and the, and the fuel and the water and electricity. But no, 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 it's not occupied. Um, you know, this is just one more delusion on top of that. And, um, you know, I don't know what else one can do but point out, because, again, I think if, if someone says, at the New York Times says, because, again, there's all this kind of media bullying that goes on with these pro-Israel groups where they, they like to act like the New York Times is some hotbed of pro-Hamas sympathy. Mm -hmm. So anytime they point something out that's inconvenient or, or do so in a way that's viewed as being tabloidy, and I, I note this in my piece, that there's this kind of fear of the tabloidy in the, in the G word genocide you can't sort of can't use it because it's seen as being um libelous or or sort of co-opting the holocaust and i understand that and let's let's not use that word right let's sort of set that aside even though i think it is again it's, at least when you talk about intent i think it's clear um let's use the word forcible population transfers at least something that sort of indicates that their goal is to get palestinians out of palestine that that is that is their clear as day goal and it's also inherent on the project of of how Israel was founded, right? This is this the Nakba never ended in key ways. It's not just a sort of thing people say. It's true. It's it is the it is the subjugation and the expulsion of people who are from that land. Seventy five percent of people in Gaza are refugees of what we would call quote unquote Israel proper. These are people that are displaced from their from their homes, uh, and the descendants of those displaced from their homes. And so it's just they don't want to because once you broach that subject and it leads to more existential questions about what it means to support this so that's why this kind of fictitious war on terror framework is so important to maintain no matter how incredible it is and i and even i would think if you said okay six weeks ago netanyahu comes out and explicitly says we are trying to resettle palestinians out of gaza i'd say okay well the media sort of has to cover that the american media has to center that that seems like big news and it's just not mentioned and i, I honestly don't know what else to say i mean I, again, I think the the cognitive dissidents that would be brought to the surface from something like that would be almost it's almost too great for people to handle. It's too it's too politically inconvenient because again, I think so much of the specter of Trump colors this, and people aren't stupid. They can look at the way in which Gaza has completely torpedoed Biden's reelection. Uh, they can see the favorables among young voters. They can see the favorables among uh, black and, and 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 Arab or Muslim voters. And I think there's kind of a, hey, let's just sort of keep the pretense of this kind of haunt for Hamas thing up for now. And let's just hope it blows over or Israel, you know, kind of runs out of gas. Because, I mean, the CIA is, uh, is, is, is over this war. The CIA routinely signals that they don't like this war. That's been leaked in several publications. So even within the sort of, you know, American military establishment. I don't know. I can't speak for the British military establishment. I'm not sure who their official kind of conduits are as, as much. But David Ignatius, who's sort of long considered the, this kind of informal CIA spokesman at the Washington Post, during the truth, wrote a couple articles that was basically like, all right, Israel, I think you're done here. I think it's time you wrap this up. So there's clearly frustration from from sectors within the security state that this is that this has to wrap up at some point soon. Obviously, Tony Blinken supposedly gave uh, Israel a deadline of, of quote, early January. Uh, I guess they had three more weeks of gratuitous, arbitrarily high deaths um, because, again, by Israel's own criteria, they can't achieve their political aim of overthrowing Hamas. And then just today, the New York Times said, basically wrote an article saying no security expert legitimately thinks Israel can eliminate Hamas because they never could. And everybody knows that because the goal is not to eliminate Hamas, it's to eliminate Palestinians in Gaza. 
Uh, for, and, and Israeli leaders don't make a distinction and they'll tell you they don't make a distinction. This distinction only exists in the Western liberal imagination. It does not exist either in Israel or in any other part of the world. I mean, everybody knows the score. People, especially in the quote unquote Arab world, uh, know what's going on, right? This is a this is a delusion, a sort of uniquely maybe Anglo-American delusion. Um, I can't speak for for France uh, or, or other European countries, but I you know English language media in the in the quote unquote West is holding on to this myth that I think the rest of the world and in, up to and and most importantly Israel itself has has moved beyond many 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 they moved they moved beyond that I think prior to October seventh they moved beyond that when they made explicit racial you know sort of uh, ethno-nationalist laws that, that that liberal Zionism, and this is why for years you did article liberal Zionism is going to die if we don't do X, liberal Zionism is going to die if we don't do Y, right? And you had people who I think in earnest were liberal Zionists saying, guys, like this liberal Zionism is, is has about two more years left if we don't do X, Y, and Z. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that's right. <laughs> to the extent it ever even existed, it, it is it is now no, it is now no longer a, a viable framework even within Israel itself. But the, the sort of vestiges of that myth must remain in, in, in American media because otherwise you have to confront some pretty nasty stuff. On medical care, because you mentioned the assault on on, on hospitals. I mean, again, a lot of this is, wow, they really have the media. They really, really have gone to dark places that even if you worked in the media for a long time, you find kind of shocking. Just give one example of a Washington Post headline, which was about four babies, just to be clear, who were killed, died, because uh, the Israeli military attacked the hospital and the doctors were unable to rescue the premature babies and therefore they died. They were killed as a consequence. Well, it's actually worse than that. Sorry, can I interrupt? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Sorry, CNN reported that what happened was that the medical professionals of the hospital were repeatedly ordered to leave or they would continue to be sniped and yeah. shelled. And then they called the, the, um, the Israeli military medical uh, uh, I guess facilitators within Gaza who claimed they were going to send an ambulance to rescue the babies if they left and they left and no one came and then the babies deteriorated. That is what CNN reported. They couched it in about 75 different, they didn't, they didn't do, want to do a tabloid headline. So if you read the headline, it's like what we know about the deteriorating babies or whatever. But no, no, that, that, that has been reported by CNN that that was what happened. They, the CNN asked IDF officials to respond to those allegations um, and they didn't even respond because that's what happened. And um, so it's actually worse than that. But yes, um, it is not just a like depraved indifference in this particular instance. It no. was actually explicitly. Yeah, they were uh, directly they yeah. were liable. For, Sorry, so. I just want to clarify that. No, no, that's some really, really important details. I'm glad you did uh, add that. But yeah, the Washington Post headline was four fragile lives found ended in found evacuated ended. Gaza yeah. hospital. Found ended. There was a search of Lexus Nexus, for those who don't know, a news archive which has going back decades, multiple news sources from all over the place. Um, no example of uh, found lives found ended that has Life never ended. ever been used in a newspaper in recorded history. It is a tortured piece of grammar for which there is no precedent in the history, it seems, of the English language, according to Google as well. People just have never used that phrase. Now, I mean, I just that's one example, but the other, which is, I think, all of this drives you insane the more you think about it and talk about it. Our chief of hospital, when it, the IDF explicitly said at the end of October, when they did this weird, the graphics designers had fun, that's for sure. Yep. Um, they uh, they said that this was the main headquarters. That's what they said, the main mm, headquarters. The beating heart of Hamas, yes. And they showed these, these kind of James Bond-esque set, set of very extravagant tunnels and meeting rooms and all the rest of it. Uh, they waged war in that hospital. Uh, it, there was a mass grave dug because so many doctors, nurses, patients were killed by Israeli military forces. It was declared a death zone by the World Health Organization. And they, they, the evidence that was then proffered was path pathetic. I don't think really even, I don't really even think does justice to how much you know a tunnel with a bathroom in it. It was, yeah. it was, you know, there were tunnels everyone knows all over. That Gaza. was that was not connected to the hospital as the Washington. It was ah, that's the key point. So then right. the Washington Post, which by the way did publish an op-ed. Uh, in November saying those who claimed Al Shifa Hospital uh, wasn't being used by terrorists have, have been now, they've been exposed as wrong and they're trying to shift the goalpost. A right. subsequent, just a Washington Post investigation found all of those Israeli claims were, were wrong. Now, again, that is a tribute that what there is good journalism being done by mainstream media. Yes. It's important to say that. But that has not, that should be one of the great scandals I'd say of our time. I mean, it, it, it is it is indeed comparable to weapons of mass destruction because I, yes. it, what it really what it really hits on is a very specific 
um, point, which is the point I tried to make in the Nation piece where I where I, I kind of said, this was prior to the Washington Post report, but I basically said the New York Times last finding says it's bullshit, which it did. Um, they didn't give the kind of official, this is bullshit. And I think they will eventually. I think the New York Times will probably do something similar with the Post it and confirm what they already confirmed, which is this is this was not a Hamas command and control center. It wasn't a command node as the White House tried to walk it back later. They used the node, which kind of means anything. There's a gun there. Um, that I what it does is it speaks to the to the fundamental. Uh, Cass Sustein had this term he uses called crippling epistemology, which is like basically your entire worldview is so fucked that it doesn't. The, the, when you're using a hunt for Hamas narrative framework, then you'd say, well, why would why would you why would they attack a hospital if they're look if 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 they're not looking for Hamas there, right? If there's not a command and control center there, why would they attack a hospital? Are they sort of gratuitously evil? And it's like, well, perhaps, but more to the point, they issued an evacuation order on October 13th that said everybody in North Gaza has to leave, including medical facilities. They called Al Shiva Hospital several times and said, you have to leave per the October 13th evacuation order. The forcible population transfer framework is the most elegant way to understand everything Israel has done because they said this is what they're going to do and they issued a clear as day in Hebrew and Arabic an evacuation order, which you can go online and read. It says everybody in North Gaza, no exceptions, including in, in Gaza City, has to go to the south because we are going to raise Northern Gaza and turn it into a demilitarized zone, whatever. They said that sort of separately, but that, that was what their order said. OK, every attack on every hospital, every attack on every school, every attack on every civilian, every 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 bombing terror campaign is designed specifically around moving roughly 1.1 million people to South Gaza. That is the way you understand it as forcible population transfers, because they issued an order saying this is what they were going to do. But that looks bad. So then they say. Then, then they say pretty much anywhere they need to clear out because by definition, hospitals are going to be one of the last places to clear out, right? Because they can't leave. They physically can't leave. NICU babies and infirmed people and those with you know, serious conditions can't just get up and walk 20, 30 miles to South Gaza. They'll die, especially when there's, no, there's not clean water um, and the convoys and roads themselves are being bombed. Right. Um, and medical professionals have a duty to stay with patients. They can't leave them. So by definition, places like hospitals will be the last places to leave. This So then Israel knows this. So what do they start doing? They start building pretextual cases to say, oh, actually, we have to bomb this hospital. We have to snipe with them. We have to shoot them. We have to terrorize them with shelling because they're Hamas command center. Now, they had peppered this idea that Shifa was a command, uh, Hamas command center before because they had bombed it before. In 2014, yeah. they bombed al-Shifa. Um, uh, so this is something they've peppered before, but there was never really any evidence. They had one throwaway line in some amnesty report about maybe one of the rooms being used by Hamas for interrogation. 2008, some New York Times reporter said he saw a Hamas fighter there. I guess if I saw an IDF fighter in, uh, you know, around a hospital in 2008, that would make it a legitimate military target. It's unclear. Um, it was extremely razor thin. We know it's razor thin because if Israel had evidence it was a command and control center, they would have provided it, not just built a 3D graphic showing a Bond villain layer that looked goofy um, to even the most credulous eye. And so they subsequently then, so then they, they did this with every hospital they attacked. They said, oh, they were shooting at us. Hamas was shooting at us. And then every single article in the New York Times and Washington Post uses this framework. It says the hunt for Hamas leads to attack in this hospital. This hospital, as uh, the New York Times said, quote, caught in the crossfire. There's no crossfire. Now, was the were our Israeli convoys attacked by fighters as they approached these hospitals? Yes. But there's no actual fighting coming from inside the hospital because it's a fucking hospital. And and Hamas, which has, you know, let's say 50 percent support, or whatever, Gaza, let's say 40 percent, whatever the number is. Right. It's gone up since October 7th. Um, you cannot have a quasi popular movement if you're using fucking hospitals. It's just common sense. Hospitals as military bases, you're going to have 0% support if you do that. Yeah. Uh, now, do they store guns and mosques here or there or, or, or residential areas? Well, yeah, because they're a guerrilla force. That's what you do. But there's very little evidence Hamas uses in any kind of systemic way hospitals as some sort of military base. There's no evidence of that at all. There never has been any evidence of that because it doesn't make sense. They don't need to. Um, and this this whole human shields framework, is, which is, again, predicated on kind of racist sleights of hand that doesn't actually have any empirical basis, um, becomes a kind of catch-all where you can use that for any hospital or any uh, UN school you want to attack. You say, oh, well, there, there's guns there. I don't know, is there? Um, and this is what they did. They, 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 
would sort of half-assly, and again, the most half-assly way possible, we're not even really trying here. Um, in the other hospital they attacked, they'd say, oh, well, yeah, uh, it was a Hamas uh, control center. And it's like, well, okay. And then they would just say people shot at us and they would move on. And there was no evidence of like finding, and maybe they would find some little like thing in the ground and say, that's a tunnel. You know, that's what it shows this was. And then they'd move on. But most of the time they didn't even bother with that. Most of the time they would just attack a hospital, shell it, and then they'd move on. And the media would go, okay. Um, and this kind of hunt for Hamas pretexts for every single thing that they were needing to clear out per their evacuation order of October 13th uh, was the preferred framework of our reporters because again, it confirmed ideological racist priors. It um, put it into this, it, it assumed good faith on the part of Israel that they sort of wanted to reduce civilian casualties, which we now know is not true, right? Reporting in, in 972 magazine and, and, and then even the CNN's own analysis of, of the amount of dumb bomb, quote unquote dumb bombs they use, right? 50% of the bombs they use aren't even quote unquote precision, whatever that means. Even though precision, not even precision, but they're not even trying, right? They're deliberately targeting civilians, deliberately targeting civilian infrastructure. We know this. That you had to hold on to this idea that they were sort of hunting Hamas leaders and Hamas control centers. And it didn't matter if it never made any sense. It didn't matter if everyone knew it was bullshit at the time, because if Israel had evidence that Shifa was this, again, this doctor no layer, we would have had evidence. Yeah. Instead, they did this little selective limited hangout thing where they showed some New York Times or some dopey New York Times reporters, supposedly some exits where Hamas fighters were. We now know that was not true at all. Um, because that's what you do when you're trying to clear out an evacuation order for a million people who, who have intergenerational trauma over the Nakba and don't want to just leave over, you know, because you promise they'll come back because the last time they left, they never came back. And that is, and if I'm doing the mass expulsion of Palestinians out of Gaza, the first thing I do is in, in if we have one of my primary, uh, again, it, it's just, a, it's dynamic. It's not they're trying to do this thing in stages. The first thing you do is you do evacuate the North to the South. I mean, that is what you would do. And so they did this, but that was never the framework Western media used because they used the framework that Israel gave them and they just accepted it, even though again and again and again and again, and it flies in the face of what we actually see with our, with our fucking eyes. Like you can see what they're doing, but don't trust your lying eyes to hunt for Hamas. At that point, you just, I mean, a critical point I just wanted to explore with you a bit as well in terms of the just flagrant unabashed racism of all of this. Um, the hierarchy of death as a concept was coined uh, during the Troubles in the north of Ireland and, and it was used to rank the importance basically of human life as it was adjudicated basically by the media. Uh, so I think top would be a British soldier and then it would be, say, a Protestant civilian. You know, it, it went like that basically. And, and so the lies of, say... Um, a Catholic or a uh, civilian in a nationalist area was was lower than right. than, than say yeah you know, so it's, that it was just a way of kind of describing how worth to human life was 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 granted. Now I mean, I, you, you know, again, I, I've worked in the Western media now, in the mainstream media for twelve years. I'm not, I don't think I'm naive about the way the media works and its flagrant racism. I've written two books, one of which tried to explore that in in detail. I mean, this is just like a, it's just on a whole new level, which is there is no limit to how many Palestinians can be killed. We're literally watching one of the great massacres of our time. I, I, I spoke to Omar Baghouti earlier, who's a co-founder of the Boycott Divestment Sanctions uh, movement. And he said this is the first live stream genocide in history. I mean, you can just watch on your social media feeds just horror after horror after horror. And I just mentioned this because, you know, Bruno, I can't say his name properly, he's Portuguese, Bruno Machez. That's my Brazilian partner, Bruno Machez. Um, he said, he keeps coming up, I can see what he's doing. He keeps coming up with uh, over 10,000 Palestinian kids have now been killed and tries to, he says, imagine them all on a stadium staring at you, their corpses. Mm -hmm. And I can see he's doing the same games I keep trying to play in my head, which is how you come up with visual descriptions, metaphors or whatever, to, to make people realize these are actually humans being slaughtered in vast numbers. And this is simply an intolerable uh, nightmare. I'm just interested just in the way that the Western media has just completely degraded, dehumanized Palestinians, either in overt ways and um, in ways, which is, you know, firstly to go back to the atrocities committed on 7th of October. And therefore that justifies any amount of death and um, to blame it, everything on Hamas, which is just a carte blanche for war crimes. Because if you just say anything Israel does 
actually Hamas is responsible, then Israel can do anything it wants. It could just right. kill, it could kill everyone, and that's so Hamas's fault. If you take uh, the human shields logic, which again is a, is a fundamentally racist logic because it assumes that they this, there was a there was a common trope people throw in a lot in the war on terror in the early days. Uh, I'm a little older than you, I think, but I remember the um, the life is cheap in the Muslim world, the sort of thing you'd say because you just sound glib and savvy. The idea that like they want to be martyrs, that they sort of Again, even that more martyrs routinely misunderstood for what it really means uh, and use this, this kind of they're seeking out death. They want to be human shields. Now, the allegation of human shields is, is a specific legal allegation that human rights groups, Human Rights Watch looked into this during cast light in 09 and found there's no evidence of it. They looked into it again in 14 during protective edge found there's no evidence of it because it has to be, you have to force someone to sort of be in a position to, to just, to just, to, to disincentivize uh a military uh, typically one with asymmetrical aerial capacity to bomb you now uh anyone who can look at a picture of gaza the destruction of gaza knows that even if they did employ human shields it's not like it would work anyway because clearly israel doesn't give a shit uh and two uh guerrilla insurrection forces that live among civilian populations as we saw we've seen in dozens and dozens of examples of throughout history does not justify legally or morally carpet bombing a civilian locations. Um, again, th three, two, two to four million Vietnamese died during the Vietnam War because the U.S. employed similar logic. Well, if they're going to sort of, quote unquote, live among the civilians, right, kind of mow the fish swims with water, uh, therefore we can just sort of kill all the civilians. That has not been deemed, a, again, a legally or, or morally sufficient argument. Uh, because, again, it tells you something about the nature of, of the asymmetry of power, that the reason why Israel... Um, and again, Israeli soldiers go to cafes, Israeli soldiers go to schools, Israeli soldiers casually live in Israel. That You know what I mean? I mean this is true of, of heavily militarized societies in general. Um, that, that this human shields logic is a fun, it, it has to exist, otherwise this is not a sustain, morally sustainable system. Um, and it's one of the reasons why the bombing and destruction of hospitals was justified in certain key ways because it was an outgrowth of a specific ideology of a human shields uh, uh, epistemological framework, because by definition, if you if you if you view vulnerability of civilians as the thing that Hamas hides behind, necessarily that which has the most vulnerability, which is a hospital, will be the thing with the most Hamas fighters. There, ergo, the Hamas command and control center. Right. So you take that to its logical extreme. And to some extent, maybe even a lot of Israeli officials drowning in their own racist ideology believed that. And so when they showed up. And it was a fucking like single tunnel, not correct, connected to a toilet or to, connected to the hospital in a fucking toilet. And they were like, maybe they were genuinely surprised. I think a lot of them just didn't give a shit and lied anyway. But, I, you know, it's possible that with when you start to believe your own human shields uh, ideology, that this is what uh, how you justify it, because otherwise you can't justify it. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you create a framework where because people say, how, how do people in Israel or in, in the U.S. who support this like live with themselves? Well, if you create a ad hoc moral framework where all deaths in Gaza are per se the fault of Hamas because they live amongst the people or whatever, you've done all the heavy lifting because then you you literally cannot kill too many of them because by definition, they're all Hamas's fault. And this ideological framework, which again informs everything from the David Leonard New York Times newsletter to NPR reporting, which sort of casually throws out this human shields libel uh, to sort of hand wave away all the civilian deaths all the time. Um, it, it makes it, there's no amount that's too high because it's not their fault. It's just Hamas kind of indirectly through some kind of moral Rube Goldberg machine killing civilians. Um, and that, I think, is what makes this death machine so sustainable, because there has been decades and decades of this kind of racist um, ideological framework that that basically says Israel, by definition, cannot actually kill any civilians. That by definition, there's people that kill unless they're Israeli hostages, they accidentally shoot. Then that's sort of a regrettable error. Um, but it's all the kind of a, the the. the it all is Hamas's fault per se. Um, and so that way the number can be 20,000, 10,000 children. And you say, well, yeah, it sucks for them, but that's Hamas's fault. And that's that's something one hears all the time and, and one hears all the time in, in Western media. And so, again, once you've established that, just as you establish this idea, this a sort of similar framework in Vietnam, I don't know if you ever read Nick Terse's excellent book, Kill Anything That Moves, um, about the more, it deals a lot actually in the kind of racist and moral framework of Vietnam. Um, and that title says it all. That was the policy, kill anything that moves, where everybody who's killed is kind of posthumously conscripted as a militant uh, or a or, or if they're, you know, between 15 and 50 years old and they're male. And then everyone else is sort of an unfortunate human shield that there's sort of two statuses you have kind of terror, terrorist or proto terrorist or human shield. 
Um, and that's the framework that's been built up for decades. It was, again, the framework in 09 and 14. I mean, I remember thinking, God, the body count, the death count in 2014 was so high at, at, uh, mm -hmm. at, one, at, at the civilian death count, according to the UN, is, was 1,581. And, and now you look at that, and that's what they, they do that in four days, five days. And of course, the, the majority won't die because of violent violence. They will die because of hunger, the collapse right. of healthcare. Jeez. I mean, that's, that's yeah. what happens in these situations. This is actually quite a unique um, um, cluster of conditions where people can't escape. Right. Um, sorry to be grim about it. Just finally, um, yeah, just to kind of circle back to a kind of accountability, really. And, you know, we mentioned earlier about, about Rwanda, the, the genocide there, and, you know, the media, the role of the media in Rwanda, that was taken very seriously. That was prosecuted as part of incitement um, as being complicit in, in genocide. I and mean, that's what happened. I am interested in this being quite a searing experience for quite a lot of people, um, where I think a lot of people have become quite politicized about this, particularly younger generations in places like the US and Britain, where because now you can get access to what's actually happening on the ground, partly because of the huge courage of Palestinian journalists who've been massacred. Um, I saw today Blinken mourning how many journalists have been killed this year around the world. The vast majority of them are actually Palestinians, and they were killed by uh, an onslaught backed by the US with their weapons. Um, but this, people can see what's happening, and they can almost look, they can make it the contrast between the way the, the media is covering this, the combination of basically apologism for Israel or just not spelling out the gravity of the situation, which is itself a huge part of the problem. Um, and they can see the truth. And I just think, what do you think? Do you think, you know, there is a, something out of this, a legacy where, you know, this could be a turning point for the, almost the legitimacy of much of the media and a lot of people will come to different conclusions, different conclusions they had before. Um, and, and there could be some accountability of some description in the future. Well, there'll be, there'll never, no, there'll be no accountability. Um, for this, that much I know for sure, at least not in any times in the immediate future. But yeah, I think there's a huge erosion of trust, um, both in print and cable media. That is, again, I think they kind of sense that, so they're here and there. They'll kind of do reports that acknowledge some reality. Um, but I think the Democratic Party, the Biden White House, is irreparably harmed. I don't think anyone's going to be. You know, some people may reluctantly pull the lever, but ultimately no one's going to be too excited. No one's going to be evangelical. No one's going to campaign. Anyone who supports this, I think for anyone under a certain age who doesn't get their news from cable news, I don't put a lot of weight in generational divides, but the, the, the generational divides between news sources is, is quite uh, well documented. Um, and it's night and day. We did a study of cable news bias against Palestinians. Um, me and an anonymous researcher I work with who, who is himself Palestinian, which is why he's anonymous. Um, and we found quite a, quite uh, conclusively the bias was was there and, and measurable. I'm working on a piece for The Intercept about bias in print media right now that'll, I think, come out next week. New York Times, LA Times, that's quite documentable. For example, for just by one example, the the complete asymmetrical use of where, of, of emotive language like massacre, slaughter, horrif horrific, uh, only is used to describe the killing of Israelis and never Palestinians. Just just to give you one example. No, Isra and, Israelis, Israelis are killed, Palestinians die. Have died, yeah, that's a popular one too. Um, uh, and, and people see this and they know this. And again, those who get their news from TikTok and, and YouTube and, and social media, not to see that those outlets don't have their own modes of, of problems, obviously, but generally they're getting, I think, less ideological filtering. They're getting, it's not being filtered through this human shields lens. They're simply just seeing people dying with American made bombs and they morally correctly conclude that that's bad. Yeah. Um, and they're, it's not being filtered through this kind of classic uh, war on terror, yeah. liberal Zionist, like human shields framework. Um, and well, I they're, seeing think, ID, they're seeing IDF soldiers posting on TikTok. I mean, well, they're, I think, yeah, they're some of the worst propaganda because again, they're playing to a different audience. They're playing for, they're playing for domestic Israeli consumption. Um, and uh, I think it's a radicalizing event for a lot of people. I don't even think we've begun to see, because again, it's not even re remotely over at this point. Israel's talking about several months, if not years. I think that every day that goes by that, that, Biden keeps sticking to this, this, you know, he's pot invested at this point that he keeps chasing good money after bad uh, politically. I think we'll see a huge, a huge depression of huge, um, ho hopefully that cynicism can be parlayed into something good and useful to try to build new systems of democracy and new systems of accountability and new systems of, of an anti-war movement. But um, for now, I think it's just sowing raw on un unadulterated cynicism. 
Um, I don't think anyone in me had, a, had any delusions about Biden, but I do think that there's a kind of, there's a heartlessness that's going into this and a kind of mindless racism, even denying the body counts, which they later kind of for, walked back in private, um, has, I think, jokerified, I think, many people, many young people. I think that, I think the the, 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 the task is how do you parlay that into A, ending this war and, in, and getting a ceasefire, even if it involves some face saving, who cares? Um, and how do you parlay that into a politics that does not permit this to happen uh, again, or, you know, to the extent to which was even left, Palestine left in Gaza to save. I mean, and that's the unfortunate thing, but no, no, no one's going to be held accountable. Biden will be held accountable. None of the media cheerleaders will be held accountable. They'll, um, because we only hold people accountable for genocides from, from smaller insignificant countries that don't have, that aren't empires. Well, it's a bleak place to start, but it is realistic. Um, but I think that just, I think underlines why we do need to, to build our alternative media ecosystems. And I think, you know, they are growing and I think that's been, you know, something we have seen. Um, but I mean, we're talking about, you know, looking for good amongst this evil is, is, is a, a challenging uh, thing to do. But Adam, that was, that was brilliant stuff. Honestly, really, really appreciate it. I think people can see um, why I wanted to speak to you about media complicity. Uh, it was a, a it was a masterclass, I would say. Um, so I really appreciate it. Do make sure that you check out everyone citations pod and also his Substack. I will include links to that in the descriptions. But um, and please like and subscribe and share this video. But Adam, really, really appreciate it. that. Was brilliant. Yeah, thank you for having me on.